So, everybody, we're very privileged tonight because we are, are on the territory of the Algonquin people. Uh, but we're more than just once privileged, we're twice privileged because we're going to be welcomed to that territory tonight by a young Algonquin leader and member of the Kitigan ZV at Anishinaabe First Nation. Caitlin Kotali is a Juris Doctor candidate in the Aboriginal Law and Indigenous tradi uh, Legal Traditions Program at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Law. In 2010, she sat on the Assembly of First Nations National Youth Council as the official spokesperson for the First Nations Youth Network. And in 2012, she was the youngest person ever in her community to be elected to Chief and Council. Caitlin is also an accomplished jingle dance performer. So you can imagine how touched I was when she offered to open our conference here tonight with an honor dance. Please join me in welcoming Caitlin. Kweka Kena, Caitlin Tolin Indishnikaz, Na Endayan Kitagan Zibi, Miguachon Je Kibijaig Nongom. Hello everyone, my name is Caitlin Tolley and I'm an Algonquin from Kitagon Zibi and Anishinaabeg. And I just wanted to mention that this territory that we are all on today is the territory of my ancestors. And this particular place that we're all gathered on this evening used to be the gathering place of my ancestors. And the river that you see behind us used to be their travel, travel ways and that used to be their traditional highways. So I wanted you to think about that. Think about the Algonquin people who traditionally inhabited this territory. Think about the fact that this is on unceded and unsurrendered traditional Algonquin territory, and that we as Anishinaabeg people still have a lot to discuss with Canada. And I hope that over the next few days that we will continue to have these discussions. We must know that these discussions won't be easy. And they're, they're going to make people feel uncomfortable, but that's okay. Because that means that learning is happening and we are growing as a country. I am 24 years old and I've been jingle dress dancing since I was 12 years old. And I would not be able to stand up here in front of you all or to go to law school if it wasn't for the fact that I have my identity, my culture, and my language. When I stand here before you, it is not my own words that I am speaking, but it is, the, it is my ancestors speaking through me. It is my ancestors telling me to speak the truth. So this evening, I'm going to be sharing with you a traditional jingle dress dance. This is not a performance. This is an honor song. And within our traditional ways and viewpoints, this dance is a healing dance. And I hope that today as I dance, I'm gonna think about the healing that needs to happen in Canada. I'm gonna think about um, the events that have happened this year that require healing. I'm gonna pray and dance for um, those of my ancestors who have been impacted by residential schools. And I'm gonna think about everyone here in this room and hope that we can move forward together. In my language, we say kikinen dum nongom, niga ninwabang, which means learn today and lead tomorrow. And that's what I hope that we can do here today. And the struggles that um, my ancestors faced aren't a lot different. They're not very different than what I'm facing today. Whereas Aboriginal youth today are still facing issues that include wanting to strengthen our identity and have a good life. So I hope that you have a wonderful conference and I hope that you think of your ancestors and think of the treaties, think of the agreements that we've signed together and how we need to continue having those conversations today. Kichimi Gwachon Jeki Bijaig, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.
Thank you, Jimmy Gwetch, for having me. Have a nice evening. Jesse is an Inuk, originally from Rigolit, Nunatsiavut, one of the four Inuit regions in the vast Inuit homeland known as Inuit Nunangat. Jesse works as a research analyst at Inuit Kapirit, uh, Kapirit Kanatami, the national Inuit organization that represents close to 60,000 Inuit coast to coast to coast. He works in data interpretation, data dissemination, policy analysis. Um, prior to joining ITK, he worked with the Nunatsiavut government to administer the provisions of the Labrador Inuit Land Claim Agreement. Please welcome Jesse Flowers. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to uh, start out by acknowledging that we're speaking on uh, traditional Algonquin territory. I thank my uh, Algonquin brothers and sisters for uh, allowing us uh, this opportunity to speak. So, um, I'm a bit of a numbers guy. Um, Aboriginal people in Canada, we represent about 4.3% of the population. Thank you. Uh, so, and there are three groups within that. Uh, the First Nations, who number roughly 850,000. Métis, who um, are around 450,000. And uh, we Inuit are uh, at 60,000. That number may have increased. Uh, I'll be waiting around for the next long form census to find uh, the number on that. So. Indy's uh, talk last night really uh, resonated with me, this idea of decentralizing solutions uh, and the interconnectedness, basically, of everything. It comports a great deal with the Inuit worldview. Um, and I had this giant indigenous rapporteur sign at my table, and I had to tilt my head at oblique angles at times just to follow along. So that was interesting. Um, anyways. I was invited here uh, to give you the uh, Inuit perspective of the conference, and um, really don't know uh, much. Sorry, I'm, I'm. Excuse me a minute. <clears throat> uh, let me just jump into it, I guess. Um, as I said, we're 60,000 in Canada. We're the minority within the minority. And uh, yet, if you look at the recent electoral map, there's a lot of red. Everybody's, I'm sure, seen that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, the Liberals uh, uh, took the entire uh, north, almost, in the entirety of Inuit Nunangat, the four regions are almost uh, all liberal, except for the, the, the Nunavik region, represented by uh, Romeo Saganash of the NDP. Why do I say this? I'm talking about, like often we refer to Canada as uh, Vancouver to Halifax, if not, if we really want to upset the Newfoundlanders. <laughs> but Vancouver to uh, St. John's. And the reality is we have, we have an, another coast. That's why we're hearing coast to coast to coast a great deal. Uh, I understand Justin Trudeau uh, appointed uh, Hunter Tutu as Minister of Fisheries, largely in part to remind Canadians that we have a third ocean, one that matters a great deal. We hear a lot about Arctic sovereignty, shipping, and so forth, uh, resource extraction. Um, but we don't hear a lot about the people that actually live there. And um, the disparities uh, that are faced by Inuit um, compared to the general population, not only uh, be between the north and the south, but non-Inuit living in Inuit communities generally fare better than, than Inuit people. And uh, we really need to um, address this with the real investment in uh, early childhood uh, development and uh, increasing capacity for us to 
uh, realize our own dreams and fulfill our own needs within our communities. Um, yeah, so I don't really have much more to say other, th other than um, it's a it's very uh, interesting conference, very um, lofty sort of ideas. Uh, are being tossed around, and um, I'm reminded that, you know, in many cases, uh, what we really need is uh, simple investment, uh, investment in communities, as Indy indicated. It's like not to look at it as a cost, but as an investment um, to uh, invest in the north. I mean, folks are more than happy to uh, concentrate on. Uh, resource extraction and, and shipping and exploiting basically the north um, but we need to uh, focus uh, a lot more on people um, who it, it may look like empty land like empty vast open land to many people but to us it's, it's our own these are our hunting grounds our, our travel routes and um, so on so um, I'm just here basically to remind you that we're here. We may be small in number, but um, we're here and we are, um, we look forward to uh, uh, failing, adapting, and innovating as well as everybody else. So adaptation is a, is a, is a very, um, it's a very common trait amongst Inuit to, uh, to adapt to such a harsh environment uh, over the millennia. Uh, shows a great deal of resilience, and I think uh, we have a lot to offer in that regard. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. We are going to start the day off in the right way today with remarks from one of our four Indigenous rapporteurs. This morning, comments are being made by Zoe Todd. Zoe is Métis from Amiskwatia Westkaigan, that's Edmonton, in Treaty 6 area of Alberta. She's a 2011 Trudeau Scholar, a PhD candidate at the University of Aberdeen, and a lecturer at the University of Ottawa. Zoe's research examines people's relationships to the environment in northern Canada, with a focus on fishing in the Western Arctic. Please go ahead, Zoe. Tanse, I come from the prairies, um, but most recently I've been living in Scotland. Um, I'm an Otapemsawak woman, Iskwayawak, um, from uh, Red River, and I'm really honored to be here this morning. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for bringing our thoughts to Paris. I couldn't help but think of my friends that I've been studying with in Europe who are undoubtedly impacted by the um, events last night. And I couldn't, think about, I couldn't help but think about the need for um, loving and caring and kind responses to one another as we struggle in the world with all of the realities that we face throughout the globe. And so um, I hope that we keep these things in mind as we move forward with all of the political struggles and um, issues that people are dealing with. So I was asked to comment on the panels on democracy that we were uh, lucky to take part in yesterday. And I wanted to just draw your attention briefly. Um, last year, a little over a year ago, I was in Scotland and I had the opportunity, probably the unprecedented opportunity as a Métis woman with Scottish roots, with Cree roots um, from Alberta to vote for Scottish independence in Scotland. And um, this lovely family that voted at the same time as me, they, they, um, they, they humored me and they took my picture in front of the polling station after I voted yes. And I took this, um, I took this vote very seriously. Uh, it was really meaningful for me um, after all of the things that my family has experienced, the displacement of Métis people by the Canadian government, um, you know, our displacement because of John A. Macdonald. Um, I went back to Scotland and I voted for their independence. Um, unfortunately, uh, only 45% of people voted. Um, but what I want you to take away from this is that 
Um, from the numbers that I heard, it was 87% of eligible voters voted in the referendum, and it was an unbelievable, unprecedented experience for me as someone who grew up in Alberta, voting staunchly NDP for years, working for the NDP. It was my first experience of, um, of an uplifting democratic, part uh, direct democratic um, participatory experience and it, it felt so good. And I have to say that after coming back to Canada last November, getting to vote for the party that won in Alberta, I'm not, I know you're not, we're not partisan, but I just want to tell you what it feels like <laughs> to vote for someone who wins. I have never had that experience. Um, so I think that, <laughs> I think that we, we, we do need to remember that it can be meaning to, meaningful to vote, and I think that I want Canadians to remember that many Indigenous peoples in this last election um, chose to vote despite conscientiously objecting to the violations of Indigenous sovereignty here. So we all have a duty now. Those votes, those votes were given in trust that, that Canada will step up and honour its reciprocal duties to Indigenous peoples here. So I want all of us to think about what it took for grandmothers who had never voted in their lives because they do not recognize the sovereignty of Canada over their nations. They chose to vote because they wanted to see something different. Because we want our families to be safe, we want our lands to be safe, we want our waters, our fish, our kin to be safe and cared for reciprocally in this place. So that comes down to us to take that very seriously and move forward as Caitlin spoke of the other night together and, and discussing these issues with care and kindness and reciprocity. Um, so I just want us all to th also to think about, um, can you switch to the next slide? I want us to also think about that role of kinship and relatedness and interconnectedness in the way that we govern this place. Um, as a Métis woman, I have cousins who are Cree, who are Dene, I have cousins who are Sinemuth. So um, being Métis in a lot of ways, we are in other people's territories. We have a duty to be uh, respectful of those, um, those territories. And as a Métis woman who has recently moved to uh, Ottawa, I am so thankful to the Algonquin people for allowing me this space to live safely and gently in their traditional territory, for taking the time to teach me about their laws and their stories. Um, I, I take this very seriously in the work that I do. My students, um, I make sure that they understand that what it means to be on unceded and unsurrendered territory. We talk about the interpretation of um, the differing interpretations of what uh, what the government says has been ceded to them and what indigenous peoples say has not been ceded and um, so as Métis peoples we are often in other people's territories and we have had to find ways to do that respectfully because we have um, you know very rich and dynamic connections across the entire country from sea to sea to sea as Jesse reminded us yesterday so this uh, to shift that, um, kinship doesn't just mean the human, it also means everything else in our world that we're connected to. So my work uh, is informed by growing up in Alberta and fishing with my family. Uh, this is my dad um, in a boat that he made when I was little and this is him teaching me how to fish. And my mom, who's not indigenous, took the picture uh, f you know, for posterity. But this is where I learned how to be a good citizen. It was on the water, it was with my family, it was learning about how to respect this place that we are so lucky to live in. So um, Professor John Boros discusses the importance of Canada expanding its understanding of Indigenous law and its understanding of legal pluralities beyond French and English common law and civil law to actually understanding that the places that we live in are enlivened by millennia deep legal orders. And these legal orders have very important things to teach us about how to respect one another and how to expand our understanding of who we have duties to beyond the human, to water, to land, to fish, to animals. Um, and so I think that as we move forward in our understanding of democracy and governance, we also have to think about um, expanding our understanding of land beyond property to something that we have a reciprocal relationship to, a caring relationship to, and that we need to live up to that. So if we could just switch to the last slide. Um, so I leave you with just a thought, a fishy thought. Um, the first fish that I caught, the first big fish that I caught, I've caught lots of small fish before that, but the first big fish I caught was a northern pike. And that fish changed my life probably forever because 
it drew me into fish worlds and it made me realize that there's something out there beyond my little human body that I have to respect. And so everything I've done since then has kind of drawn me back to that lake, Baptiste Lake in North Central Alberta. And everything I do is informed by an understanding that I, I, I owe everything that I have to these non-human persons that we share this space with. And I think that as we move forward, I really want us to think about, Indy, um, Indy Johar told us about the importance of systems change, thinking of systems. I would say that indigenous philosophies and laws and stories inherently do that. And so I invite you to respectfully engage with these, um, these ways of knowing and the, this thinking, um, but to do so reciprocally. So come and, and learn with Indigenous peoples, don't take from Indigenous peoples. So thank you so much. Um, hi, hi. Have a really good rest of the day. So we come now to the closing of our conference um, and the remarks of our last Indigenous rapporteur. Aaron Mills is a Bear Clan Anishinaabe from Kuchiching First Nation, Treaty 3 Territory, and North Bay, Ontario, Robinson, Huron Treaty Territory. Aaron holds an LLM from Yale Law School and a JD from the University of Toronto, where he served as editor-in-chief of the Indigenous Law Journal. He is currently a doctoral candidate at the Faculty of Law at the University of Victoria. His doctoral research examines Anishinaabe constitu constitutionalism and is motivated by the belief that the re revitalization of Indigenous legal orders stands to benefit all Canadians. Please join me in welcoming Aaron Mills. You can hear me? Bonjour, and then we're going to talk. Nimi Quinema, Ingu Miage, and Ishinabeg. Mami Wininawak, Ishinakade, going to bow at Oma Aki. Kujijing, Zaga Igan, Minwa, North Bay, Odinang, Nindunjaba. Makwa, Indo Dame. Wobishki, Maingin, Minwa, Batwaitang, Indigo. Nimi Gwichi Wendam. I said to you in uh, Nishinaabemuin, uh, hello, all my relations. I wanted to recognize you in that way because we're all connected. And I recognized my presence here on the traditional territory of the mobile peoples, the Algonquin peoples of this land. I said I'm from uh, Kuchiching First Nation on Rainy Lake uh, and from North Bay, Ontario. I'm of the Bear Clan. Uh, I wanted to start by recognizing two things. One, uh, I just wanted to point out uh, at the outset, uh, Caitlin uh, danced for us. And I suspected that for many of us, uh, that may have been a sort of challenge in understanding what exactly that was about. And it isn't for me to speak on it, but I just wanted to say just this one thing, that that was actually work being done. On, and on your behalf, actually. And so just to challenge you as you leave here to think through what that might mean, work in that context, and why would it have been done, and to instill conversations about that. The second thing is I just wanted to honor uh, the huge number of speakers uh, who have contributed in so many different ways, um, because I'm going to go in a bit of a different tack here and draw a kind of division between most of us. And so I think it's important before doing that to honor all those contributions. And it was very clear to me throughout this conference, uh, the sincerity and the dedication uh, well above and beyond just the knowledge base that everybody brought to try and address some of the most vexing, wicked problems that Canada is facing. So I am on a bit of a different frequency in uh, thinking through how we might go about addressing problems that's challenging. And as a way into that, uh, I've got permission today uh, from the folks involved to show you a video. And so I, can we cue the video, please? Uh, I wanted, I'd like to start with that.
clear i know there's something big happening we want to rise up from the hole we're standing in it's time to get out and find strength in my native pride i will represent my land and make it right live in a small place with big dreams i will take any chance that you give me so let me think deep don't want to be forgotten want to be a light while the devil plotting i want to see the truth i'm just being honest i want to be the best but i gotta keep it modest i want to see my culture succeed i want to feed that love inside me work endlessly to find the energy and give everything to be free it's a long road but we'll get Yeah, it's pretty incredible um, what they've done. And uh, I have to say I'm really fiercely proud. It's... Uh, It's a wonderful, positive, feel-good message. But well above and beyond that, there's something critically important happening in that video, something that could very easily be missed. And so I think there's a, a really important gift that's being shared with us in this video. And so I wanted to talk just for uh, my few remaining minutes about that. It identifies a serious problem, and it's not just indigenous folks, of course, although in Canada we certainly experience it in a unique way, but a sense of hopelessness and whom they refer to as the lost souls, people hurting and very much in need. And I, I want to explore the response that they tender in their song uh, to that problem, because I think it's really striking Theirs is, is not a world centered on uh, empowering the idea of a, a rational, autonomous agent pursuing its own self-interest. And yet they don't start 
They don't have a corporatist model either, right? They're not looking at the state. It's not a protest song for things that the state might have done or has done incorrectly. They seem to be focusing elsewhere. They reject both the standard starting points and importantly, the languages that they generate. So I wanna to turn to what they say. And so um, Cassie Capay, one of the lyrics she shares is, uh, we can rise or we can fall, I guess it all depends on me. So we have there a strong assertion of individual agency and this alternative vision that hasn't been lost. And then Janelle Manitowabi says, a flood that came in the dark, but our people never changed. We've stayed together from the start. It only made us braver. Well, so there's a strong sense of group identity being asserted as well. That hasn't disappeared. What's interesting is how they fit together. And so here's the critical piece. Chelsea Bunting says, to the lost souls, find your strength in the love we have to share. Find your strength in the love we have to share. I'm gonna unpack that in a moment, but first I just want to attend to the unusualness of centering love in a context like the one we're all in right now and how unusual that is. And so I want to say there's nothing romantic happening here, right? This isn't an anti-politics, nor is it a shirking of the responsibility, a kind of reckless opting out of addressing the serious problems by just saying all you need is love. There's actually something much bigger going on here, and I would suggest to you that rather this is the disclosure of an alternative constitutional vision, one where political community generates not from autonomous selves, but from interdependent ones. And I have, to dis I have to say this is interdependence not as a consequence of the exercise of individual choice ever increasingly unfettered. Uh, but it's an ontological claim. It's to say that is what there is. That is the logic of life itself. And if you can't even imagine what that might mean, uh, you could head to the Wabano Center here in Ottawa to get a sense of it, where I had a wonderful meal uh, and tour last night. And at the center of that community, there's the largest medicine wheel I've ever seen on the ceiling. Uh, and it's in a dome, and so it creates this stunning echo chamber. And of course, this song is called Echo My Soul. And this is the idea at the heart of what these four women from Lac Sewell uh, in Treaty 3 uh, have to share with us as I understand it, and it's that we're always already in relationship. That is, there is no space outside of interdependent being. We're all weak and often in need, but when I'm not, I will carry you. Or as these women put it, uplift the brave hearts, and you can echo my soul. I got a, a gentle reminder uh, from Alexandra uh, Trudeau over breakfast this morning uh, of the, ex the importance of making explicit that this isn't just something for Indigenous peoples, that this is for everyone all the time. And I, for one, uh, extend a, a constant open invitation for anyone who wants to take on interdependence as a life way. Seek out me, seek out any elder you have access to, to start those conversations, to think through what it might mean for you. Uh, and then continuing in that vein, uh, this has also made its way, and I'll just close with this, uh, into pop culture too. So uh, many of you will know stars, and uh, Torkel sings, uh, take the, the weakest thing in you and beat the bastards with it, and always hold on when you get love so you can let go when you give it. Uh, Miu, miigwech, that's it. <laughs>